Hi everyone, welcome. We're going to get started and folks can hop in and I know some folks might also be on the live stream. Uh, my name is Kitty Hu and I use she, her pronouns. I'm part of the Can You Hear Us campaign and I'm currently on Lenape and Canarsie land in Brooklyn, New York. I am a Chinese girl with long black hair, wearing a black shirt, slightly red cheeks in front of a white wall and a window in the back. Um, so thank you so much for joining us today. Uh, first, before we get started, I wanted to state that the Can You Hear Us campaign acknowledges the sacred land upon which we work and live and build community and host this event. And it's been a site of human activity for thousands of years. And as a national campaign, we know that this land is home to indigenous peoples across Turtle Island who have stewarded this land for hundreds of generations. And we recognize the repeated violations of sovereignty and territory and water perpetuated by colonizers and settlers who have impacted the original inhabitants of this land. And so we extend our respect to citizens of these nations who live here today and to all indigenous people. We also know that this land acknowledgement is insufficient. It doesn't undo the harm that has been done and continues to be perpetuated now against indigenous peoples and their land and water. And so we ask today's folks to consistently recognize the original stewards of their land, to follow indigenous leadership and to financially support and resource local indigenous efforts and want to thank Upstander Project and Cultural Survival for helping us with this language. Um, so welcome to the Can You Hear Us speaker series. We are here to think about how can we reframe our relationship with the planet from one that is extractive to one that is healing and energizing and honest. And it was programmed to really center the voices and experiences of BIPOC leaders in the climate movement and to think about how we can move forward. And this series has been produced as part of a larger impact campaign titled, Can You Hear Us? Uh, which accompanies the Hulu documentary, I Am Greta. And we'll drop links throughout the day in the chat where you can learn more about the campaign focus and resources and whatnot. Um, so before we get started, we know that folks might still be hopping in, but we wanted to launch a quick poll to just gauge who's here today. Um, Ariel, if you don't mind launching that and I'll continue talking behind it. Um, so in efforts to spotlight accessibility in this movement, we wanted to note that you, if you need captioning today, we had an issue with our webinar format. And so you might wanna hop onto the YouTube for the auto captioning. Um, and we'll definitely make sure that when we post this recording, it will have the full subtitles underneath that have been edited. Um, and also would like to thank Jason and Sue today for helping us as being our interpreters. Um, and so now I would like to kick it off to our facilitator and moderator, Lyell Camargo. Lyell is a cultural strategist, land steward, filmmaker, artist, and is a descendant of the Yaqui tribe and Mayu tribes of the Sonoran Desert. Uh, Lyell is transgender and a non-binary person. They graduated from UC Santa Cruz with dual degrees in feminist studies and legal studies. Uh, Lyell was the impact producer for the North Pole show season two with executive producer Rosario Dawson. And they currently produce and host Did We Go Too Far, a podcast with the ecological justice organization Movement Generation. And at the Center for Cultural Power, as the ecological arts and culture manager, they created alongside Fabiana Rodriguez, a Climate Woke, a national campaign to center BIPOC voices in climate justice. And due to wanting to shape a new world, they co-founded Shelterwood Collective, a land-based organization that teaches land stewardship, creative visioning, and healing for long-term survival. And they are a transformative justice practitioner for six years and still find ways to bring lessons and alternatives to the carceral system to their work. Uh, most recently, Lyell was named on the GRIST 2020 Fixers list, as well as celebrated by Yerba Buena Center of the Arts list of people to watch out for in 2019. Thank you so much for kicking it off for us. Thanks for having me here, Kitty. What a pleasure to be in this speaker series. Uh, I just want to give it up to, yeah, they're always doing such amazing visionary stuff. I, when you all like gave me your campaign goals for this year, I was like, wow, y'all are literally taking on 
the whole picture of what we need to shift in order to survive. So thank you for having me here. I'm so grateful. Um, so my name is Lael Camargo. I use they, them, theirs pronouns, as it was already mentioned. I come to you from Wichita Territory of the Ohlone's People's Lands in Berkeley, California, also known as Berkeley, California. I'm wearing a fun, colorful shirt with maroon, yellow, uh, white, and uh, orange stripes. I'm coming to you with some fun blue glasses, round glasses. Uh, I'm brown skin. Um, I have short, uh, dark brown hair. I also have these fun blue headphones that I'm wearing. Um, and there's also some fun plants, um, beautiful plants behind me. Um, just as a reminder for all of our speakers, and I'll keep reminding people as we're going to try to speak as slowly as possible, uh, to do visual descriptions as much as possible with slides as well. Um, and I, I am humbled to come to you, as I already mentioned, in rich in territory of the Ohlone lands of, in the Bay Area, California. So I'm excited to be here, y'all. It's gonna be a wonderful conversation. We're definitely gonna hear about some amazing work that folks are doing on the ground in the visionary um, and around food justice. It's, it's gonna be amazing. Um, I wanna introduce you all to our first speaker. Um, it's, her name is Daisy Francoeur. Um, she is a member of the Oneida um, Nation. Uh, a cultural survival director of, strategy, of strategic partnerships and communications um, from Cultural Survivor with over a decade of experience working in philanthropy at nonprofit organizations and grassroots organizing and as a direct service provider in education, mental health, corrections, serving indigenous people with disabilities or special needs, domestic violence victims, the homeless and formerly incarcerated inmate, inmates. Her experience has deepened her advocacy and movement building work as a radical woman in philanthropy. As a former program officer of the Christensen Fund, she managed the San Francisco Bay Area program and supported her colleagues with other global regional programs at the fund. Later, she transitioned into consulting as a strategist, resource mobilizer, organizational development consultant, and philanthropic advisor, supporting indigenous organizations locally and globally. Her work centers to empower tribes, native nations, as well as indigenous led institutions to build their capacity, leadership, organizational infrastructure and develop holistic strategies to support their resource generation and organizational sustainability. As an indigenous fundraiser, philanthropic advisor and donor educator, Daisy strives to build the capacity of philanthropy, foundations and individual donors by transforming their understanding of indigenous rights, indigenous issues, biocultural diversity, climate and social justice, as well as other regenerative systems. So I'll leave you all with Daisy Francoeur to talk to us about her amazing work. It's nice to meet you, Daisy. Yawanko, Lael, Sigili Swakwek, Daisy Nyungets, Anawal, Niwagi Dalota, Anayate Aga, Niwagu Jota. Hi, everyone. My name is Daisy Francoeur. I just um, introduced myself in my own Indigenous language, Ngwehoneha. And um, as Lael had mentioned, I am from the United Nation of Wisconsin. I'm Haudenosaunee and a member of my nation's turtle clan. My um, pronouns are she, her, and hers. And a visual um, description, I have short black hair. I have a white um, shirt with stripes. And I'm in, I think, like a dimly lit uh, Chicago apartment um, located on the lands of the Potawatomi and Ojibwe nations. Um, However, Chicago has served as a, a, a central home to many indigenous nations, and this used to be and still continues to be a, a major um, stop along trade routes for indigenous nations um, in now what we call the Midwest. Um, as Lael had mentioned, I am the Director of Strategic Partnerships and Communications at Cultural Survival, um, and we are a nearly a 50-year-old NGO and veteran indigenous rights organization and um, Indigenous-led in the U.S. registered nonprofit. Um, and we advocate for Indigenous people's rights and support Indigenous communities, self-determination, cultures, and political resilience. Yawa, thank you. Awesome. Thanks, Daisy, for that introduction. Um, 
So next, I'm gonna introduce another speaker, um, Lauren Cardelli. Lauren Cardelli is the co-founder and executive director of A Growing Culture, a 501c3 nonprofit um, that confronts the unjust power in the food system. A Growing Culture is a movement support organization that strives to democratize food systems by connecting, amplifying, and resourcing those on the front lines of the fight for food sovereignty. Lauren is one of one member of a collective of activists working collaboratively to serve frontline partners. Thanks for being here, Lauren. Thank you. Um, it's wonderful to be here with everyone. Thank you. My name is Lauren Cardelli. Um, I work with the Growing Culture. I am currently um, in Mexico City, which is part of the Triple Alliance, the Aztecs, Texcoco, and Tlacopan um, territory. Um, I use he, him pronouns, and I am sitting here in front of this boring wall. Um, I think. I think it's blue, but it looks gray. Um, I am wearing glasses that really need the lenses replaced. They're kind of blurry. Um, and I have short hair, beard, um, and I have um, this plaid shirt that's purple and dark bluish, I guess. Um, and I am a Puerto Rican Jew born in New York City. Are we doing um, just, okay, you want me to present? Okay, I'm sorry, yeah. I yeah, yeah but tell us a little bit about your work, Lauren. I know you had some questions you wanted to kind of reflect on with us. So feel free to jump into what knowledge you want to leave us with at this time before we move into the Q&A part. Okay, yeah, I don't have, um, let's see, much knowledge to share, but I will, um, you know, a growing culture works with peasants, smallholder and indigenous farming communities around the world. Um, we, we work to confront unjust power in the food system because everything is about power. We think of our food system as an environmental relationship, which um, really at best is half the story. Um, you know, we talk about the very first seeds sown in agriculture being seeds of wheat and barley, but um, they really were seeds of hegemony, patriarchy, racism, genocide. Um, we now exist in a world where those seeds have, you know, have, have, have come forward and we reap what we sow and we look outside our, our windows and we see authoritarian governments that arise. We see, you know, um, the prison industrial complex. We see neoliberalism and, and, and colonialism still in action today. And so it's really important for us to kind of take a moment and recognize our food system as what it really is, 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 is a human rights issue. And it is a, a, a model of social reorganizing um, based on settler colonialism, which has devastated the world and biodiversity. And I like to kind of just show a few aspects of this, you know, so people can understand what framing and lens that, that our organization uses when we're looking at, at, at our global food system. Um, so I'm gonna share my screen here. I'm gonna try to do this. I am not much of a tech person. So please forgive me if, um, you know, a text comes up from my mother on the screen or something, I don't know. Um, you know, so, you know, I, I wanna talk about the peasant food web, you know, cause we think of this concept of, of living in a food chain. We don't, we don't live in a food chain, we're food chained. Our system is, is designed to oppress. Um, who grows our food? Nobody that looks like me. You know, I know when you see documentaries, when, 
when we look at the media representation of farmers, we see some some man and white man in, in overalls. It's just just couldn't be further than the truth. It's it's the peasant food web, you know. In seven, you know, in in the United States, they expect seventy to eighty percent of the hands that touch our food are are, are hands of color, um, majority migrant hands. Um, around the world, you know. My estimation is that 95% of our food system is, is I mean, is, of the food consumed is produced by people of color, at least. So let's, let's, let's re-examine why we are centering an outlier, because we're perpetuating a system of white supremacy at every chance we get, you know? So who's producing our food? It's the peasant food web. It's, it's, it's 2.5 billion people strong, right? It's, it's, it, 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 it's people around the world that, that and, and, and it's this community that controls 19% of agricultural land while producing 70% of the world's food consumed, right? Protecting 95% of agricultural biodiversity, the vast majority of total biodiversity, right? And, and supporting at least 60% of jobs, depending on where you are, right? And this population, right? Let's just say like smallholder farmers produce 70% of the world's food on less than a fifth of the agricultural land. So when we talk about efficiency and productivity, I mean, even when we attempt to talk about it, we're defending a system that is false. We're, we're, we're validating the industrial agricultural system as, as needed to even be recognized and acknowledged when that's just not the truth. Industrial agriculture does not feed the world. Peasant, smallholder, and indigenous communities around the world feed the world. And they do that with every obstacle like in front of them, with, like, with, with systems, global markets, financial currency systems that are designed to oppress. And so if they do this with everything against them, imagine what they could do actually if we tipped the balance in their favor, if we created a food system that actually recognized them. But how does this ingenuity happen? You know, it happens in a very non-linear way. And we have to understand that when we think about our food system. And that's why we use food web rather than food chain, because like this is from a Bangladeshi farmer. They drew this drawing talking about their, their rice value chain, right? And, and so they were asked to draw their value chain from you produce rice all the way to market. And this is a hard picture to, to see. And I, and I apologize um, because it's very complicated, but the point of it is complicated because you see on the top left corner, you see medium lowland rice, you see upper land rice, right? And then all the way in the top right, you see the market, but look at all that it has to go between. This is, this is gender dynamics. These are, these are, these, these are relationships. This is waste. This is fish. This is maize. These are, these are palm trees. These are coconuts. Everything represents an inner a relationship and interaction, and this is innovation happening, right? This is how food is produced. It's not produced in this linear and extractive way. You know, our food system is designed that way. And, and to understand how our food system works, I think the next four maps kind of tell that story, right? When you look at biodiversity hotspots around the world, right? This is a map of, of, of the world and, you know, unfortunately, um, not to appropriate size, it still represents a, a, a Western colonial um, size dynamic, you know. Um, however, if you look at this at this map, what you'll see is uh, the areas that are that are most biodiverse, right? Um, you'll see those circle, those those terrestrial biodiversity hotspots. Now, now focus on those areas because then when you see the lingual diversity hotspots around the world, you see it's something very similar. And and so what this first tells you is that. There is no cultural diversity without biological diversity. There's no biological diversity without cultural diversity. They're interrelated. The industrial agricultural system is designed to attack both. Every seed has a story, right? Every, 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 every culture has, has, has their, 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 their food systems designed and informing everything they do. I mean, this is what happens. And so the next map that I wanna show you is climate vulnerability. And so this is very much the same hotspots where you're seeing that are most vulnerable to a system perpetuated by the West, by the industrial North, by the colonizers. 
And what worse, when you want to understand how our industrial agricultural model works, you'll see land grabbing. You'll see the theft that has never ended, the genocide and forced migration that has never ended. This is existing today. This is just the land grab since the year 2000. Land theft is not a thing of the past. And this is why we don't talk about permaculture, regenerative ag or bio-intensive or biodynamic or any of that. Like even agroecology, we talk about food sovereignty because what we're looking for is a system that ends colonialism, that ends extraction and exploitation. We have that bold, audacious idea of a food system that nurtures everyone. We, and to get that, there needs to be liberation. There needs to be sovereignty over land. There needs to be land back. There needs to be reparative justice because this system is evidence that, you know, the state is designed to oppress and to conquer. And when we create a system that allows that to happen, we expand that outward and we reward the people that are the beneficiaries of this injustice. Now, we, you know, I, I, I know some people have a hard time understanding how the industrial agricultural system doesn't feed the world. And, and so I, I wanna pull up this Cassidy et al. article and, and the statistics, you know, you, you see five data points here. There's blue, green, yellow, orange, red. The blue is USA, the green is China, the yellow is Brazil, um, the orange is the world and India is red. Um, and so when you look at this, you know, calories produced, the USA is producing more calories than anybody else. Now, when you go to the right side of it and you see calories delivered, look how little of those calories produced they're actually delivering. The system is caught in, in, in an inefficient model of industrial agriculture of food waste, which is a third of it is wasted of, of ethanol production and, and, and plant-based joy, you know, soy, whatever, you know, and, livestock feed, right? These aren't efficient systems at all. And so when you actually look at this calories delivered, India's out, out delivering calories and they're growing, you know, less than half of what the United States is. So when you actually focus on efficiency, look at this, 91% efficiency is India where the United States is 34. So we have to end these narratives. We have to recognize and celebrate the ones that are actually growing our food. We have to understand that we live in a system from the very beginning. That Neolithic revolution created that system. I mean, you can look at this, you know, silly, ridiculous cartoon of, of daily life in Mesopotamia, you know, one of the birthplaces of, of, of agriculture, and you can see the gender dynamics. You can see the patriarchy. You can see the racism. You can see the classism. You can see it everywhere. These systems from the start were designed to exploit. And that's what we now know is that these walls that surround the Wang Z, the Nile Delta, the Mesopotamia, these walls were not designed to keep outsiders out. They were designed to keep peasants in because the system was founded on exploitation. And today we live in that world perfected where for every dollar of aid you know the, the global south receives in, in, in you know in, in in the countries in africa are receiving 24 dollars is taken out in net outflows this is legalized institutionalized theft that's happening to this day and i'm sorry for presenting some some slides that are you know uh um, because they're kind of boring, but I just wanted to give some kind of a backside to, to understanding our food system. And our food system is not broke. It's, ex it's, it's, it's designed to do exactly what it is. And we have to be careful with our words. We have to be careful with what we're advocating for. Are we advocating for quote unquote, more sustainable practices in a system designed to exploit and oppress? Or are we trying to stop that exploitation? Are we trying to recognize the ones who grow our food, center them in a process and design a food system that's actually led by these ones, guided by communities, indigenous, smaller and peasant farming communities that know how to produce our world's food. 
There's so much westernization. There's so much classism and elitism and gatekeeping and this stupid narratives that you see everywhere presented. My microbiome, my gut, my vegan diet, my garden, whatever. come on. Let's, let's, let's think deep and move from this white supremacy of, of individualism and start to open to collective solidarity. What does your local farmer's market look like? Who's shopping? What is your local restaurant that's celebrating local food look like? Who are the farmers they're supporting and who are actually farming on those farms? Are they being taken care of? Are there pictures on the walls? What does these really look like? And how are we just perpetuating this individualism and this consumer privilege and this gatekeeping of health and nutrition and wellness? Chico Mendez, and I will end with this, he says, Environmentalism without class struggle is just gardening. So bring class struggle to the forefront. Recognize the people that need to be recognized. Support them. Stand in solidarity. That means that you're not leading the quest. You're not making decisions. You're supporting the work of others. And be comfortable with that. I think that's it. I appreciate you all. Lauren, I would say that's very short from the it. I think it might be the beginning of something. What do you think? <laughs> yeah. um, I don't know how to do these, these digital worlds. I can't see what people are doing. I can't have somebody, I don't know if I'm speaking too long or too short or if I'm saying the wrong thing, I apologize. <laughs> You're doing everything right. Thank you so much for literally blowing my mind bringing me out to grounding me in the historical colonial context and just setting that framework that I think we need. I want to bring back uh, Daisy, Daisy Francoeur, if you could join us. I feel like Lauren did such a great job at giving us the like historical context of how we got to where we are now, which I think we can all agree is kind of a shit show. And a lot of what you do is really activating and distributing power to indigenous communities. So I would love to hear more about your work and hear about the amazing badass stuff that you're doing, everything from philanthropy to grassroots. So I'll leave you all with Daisy to kind of tell us more about what does the future need to look like by giving indigenous people the power to reshape that historical violation that's been going on for years. Thanks Daisy for coming back with us. Yes, thank you. Um, my apologies, I had misunderstood initially. I thought we were just doing introductions, but thank you for bringing it back. Um, and it's, you know, uh, Lauren is always, his passion is very inspiring. So it's a tough act to follow, but I, I will do my best. Um, but yes, Lauren laid out um, very beautifully uh, a lot of the, the context, the background, the, the, the what, right, the issue at hand. And as we look to the future, um, we really need to think about um, how we're uplifting and supporting and resourcing and centering um, Indigenous peoples, Indigenous rights, Indigenous leadership um, in these spaces as we're, as we're talking about the environment, as we're talking about conservation, as we're talking about um, climate change, right? Um, and, and really reclaiming, not even just shifting the narrative, but reclaiming the narrative as we're thinking about um, the future. And so, um, but as, as, um, as Lauren had really outlined in terms of, of the past and how we got here and, and where we're at today, um, you know, as we look in the context of the United States and we think about conservation and within that kind of geographical boundary, um, you know, a lot of this was really sparked by um, former President Teddy Roosevelt, who um, really caused a lot of harm and set a, a large precedence in the United States and how we viewed conservation, how we viewed environmentalism um, and, and putting, you know, uh, 230 million acres into public lands and 150 million acres into forests. But that caused a lot of harm. You know, it took indigenous access from indigenous peoples um, from their lands and from their territories and really excluded them in the process and, and violated their rights, including their right to free prior informed consent. And so as we're, as we're thinking about um, moving forward, it's, it's recognizing and understanding the past, right? And how conservation organizations and just the mainstream movement of conservation 
has has really caused a lot of harm um, to uh, Black, Indigenous, and, and communities of color all over the world um, and in local communities. And um, conservation at large really centers a narrative that doesn't include people. It, it really centers this idea that, um, or, or excludes rather that um, people don't have an intimate relationship to place when in fact Indigenous peoples do and that the biodiversity of our lands uh, are, are not just something that happened magically, but has been done so intentionally um, by design. And then as we're thinking you know, more about um, how the conservation movement and how the climate movement is changing, a lot of that is large in part to um, BIPOC and, and really indigenous communities and and they're organizing and and the and our movement you know it's incredibly diverse and um that's really reflected a lot in like our international fora spaces you know for example like at the cop we always ensure that indigenous peoples are represented from all of the the seven biocultural regions and so um in terms of opportunity and as we're thinking about strengthening the movement especially for indigenous peoples um, I think the missing link or the link that needs more support and specifically more resources is connecting the local and the regional to the international movements and vice versa. Um, and but as we're thinking about climate change and, we're, and when we're thinking about how that impacts Indigenous peoples, like Lauren mentioned, Indigenous peoples, we are on the forefront and on the front lines of climate change and, and feeling those impacts alongside of our BIPOC relatives too. Um, and you know, some examples of that include um, receding um, sea ice and, and loss of substance resources in the Arctic um, from you know, the raging wildfires, um, not only in California, but all over the world, right? Including the Amazon and Siberia. And you know, this it seems like every year it gets worse and worse, right? And that is because indigenous peoples have, in most of these places, in access to their traditional lands and territories and their traditional knowledge and their practices have essentially been outlawed in and especially in California are unable to practice um, their own traditional fire management practices. And, and we're seeing this overgrowth, right? And so that has really resulted in um, this this um, um, this wildfire epidemic, right? Um, across the world, we're seeing climate change um, show up in incredible devastation as a result of hurricanes um, that has affected communities in Central America, including Guatemala and and typhoons in the Philippines that have really devastated entire villages, right? And so climate change, shows up in so many different ways. It shows up in our food systems and in changing climate patterns and changing seasonal patterns. And, you know, just for example, like my family, we're noticing this change in, in the times of when we plant our own naste, our corn, right? And then uh, we're seeing it come a few weeks later now because the seasons are changing. And then therefore our ceremonies, which are based off of the seasons, based off of the moon patterns, based off of the weather patterns are changing too. And so we're seeing this, this um, disruption in our, in our, in our traditions um, that we've, all, we've very meticulously um, planned for, right? So those are some of the impacts that we're seeing um, as, a, as climate change and how that's impacting indigenous peoples. But um, I think what we need to talk about too is understanding also again like Lauren had mentioned like how we got here right and so that uh one thing you know that Lauren had mentioned was you know these ideas or these man-made constructs of things like manifest destiny the doctrine of discovery colonialism capitalism extractivism white supremacy institutional religion all of these things to me have the same goal excuse me, to divide, conquer, and control people and place. And so, <clears throat> sorry, I've been talking all day. 
they've been used to dominate and extract um, people in place. And so therefore, these institutions, these ideologies, they have conditioned us for hundreds of years to operate within this individualistic manner, right? And it has really um, taken us away from operating as a collective, as a community, um, and, and has really separated us from our inherent responsibilities to people in place. And so as I speak to these responsibilities, these responsibilities, um, in other words, are reflected in our traditional knowledge. And our traditional knowledge um, really is the answer, is the solution to um, addressing climate change. And, and we see our traditional knowledge reflected. It's in our original instructions. It's in our stories, our origin stories our songs, our languages, our cosmovisions. And, and it's rooted in reciprocal relationships with our environment. Um, and so one thing that I see as an opportunity as we're thinking and, and trying to create solutions for climate change, we have to really uplift indigenous peoples, indigenous peoples' rights, our leadership, and their traditional knowledge as we're thinking about solutions for the future. And, and just some like evidence, right? Cause we live in this like evidence-based society where we always have to justify um, why that would be a good solution. And so, um, you know, just some statistics, indigenous peoples, while we make up just 6.2% uh, of the global population, um, totaling, you know, 476.6 million uh, peoples worldwide, um, we, our territories contain over 80% of the Earth's remaining biodiversity. And as Lauren had mentioned, you know, the reasons for that and that indigenous peoples, you know, we manage at least 24% of the total carbon stored above ground um, in the world's tropical forests and um, 11, and sorry, and indigenous lands also hold um, unquantified megatons of sequestered carbon as 11% of the planet's forests are under our guardianship. So those are just some um, statistics about the, and, and that's representing the current conditions that we're in, right? And so we need to imagine what could those numbers be? What could those impacts be if we were to really honor indigenous rights, including our rights to our lands, territories, and natural resources, our rights to to govern and self-determine self how we govern and steward those lands. Um, and, and that's really important to think about as we're uh, talking about climate change. Um, but, you know, capitalism, colonialism, all of the isms have, uh, have really separated us from the land, has really separated us um, from how we're supposed to engage with each other. And in order to return to that right relationship, we have to reframe our relationship to the land and to one another at the individual level to start. And, and there is no one solution that fits all, um, but we have to really rebuild that intimate and reciprocal relationship with the land to start. So that means start, you know, planting your own gardens, investing in place-based solutions and place-based economies. Um, and we have to really view the land as, um, you know, and recognizing it provides us with so much nourishment and that we need to also nourish it back. And so as we're decolonizing our relationship to the land and centering indigenous values um, like respect, responsibility, reciprocity and relationships, those are some ways that we can move forward um, as we're, addressing the climate justice, or sorry, climate change epidemic that we're all in. And, um, but as we're thinking about this kind of more as, I guess, at a policy level or an institutional level, or even collective level, again, this, this really means that we have to honor indigenous rights, you know, otherwise outlined in the United Nations Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples. We have to center and resource indigenous leadership, 
because indigenous peoples, we are the best stewards of our lands and our waters and our ecosystems. And to just kind of wrap some of these things up, um, uh, I probably won't get to everything that I wanted to share today and, and that's okay, but I really agree with um, Lauren's point about land back. And I think this is something that we're seeing all over the place now, and that's great. But we also have to recognize the, as we're thinking about land back, it's it's a movement and an action of, uh, that requires everyone. It's not just indigenous peoples securing the land and fundraising for it and doing those negotiations. Everyone has a role in that. And we have to recognize that the benefits of land back benefits everyone and everything, all living things, right? Because we're thinking about how an understanding and, and honoring that indigenous peoples are the best stewards of our environment. So if we're able to restore their relationship to land, secure their access to land, return those titles back to indigenous peoples, their stewardship over those environments benefits everyone. And we all have a role to play in ensuring that that happens. So it's both a movement, it's an action, um, that requires all hands on deck. And, and I'll just kind of wrap this up here as we're thinking about the future and, and what is needed and, and, and especially um, the futures and visions of indigenous peoples within this kind of, uh, within this movement um, that really in, includes increased leadership of indigenous peoples in these leadership positions, right? So we're, we saw Deb Holland, you know, step into her new, new leadership role and, you know, it's 2021 and we're still saying so-and-so is the first of something, right? And like, we need to move past that, that, that narrative and that action. And that means continuing to build off of that legacy and those actions and increasing indigenous peoples in more decision-making um, spaces and bodies, right? At the local level, at the state level, at the federal and international level, um, both in public and private and corporate spaces. We need indigenous leadership there. And we need um, everyone from all backgrounds to ensure that we're getting them there, right? Getting Deb Howland into that role was largely um, credit to a lot of indigenous organizers, but a lot of other non-indigenous and, and BIPOC organizers played a role in getting her there. And so we all have a responsibility to uplifting indigenous leadership and, and specifically indigenous women and youth leadership. Um, and uh, I think I'll stop there. There's a lot more to say, but I just wanna be really mindful of um, other people's uh, speaking. Thanks, Daisy. Really coming in. It was like just perfect serendipitous that we got the land historical and you're providing us the vision. So much wisdom there. Thank you so much for taking us and excited to hear what else you got to share with us afterwards. Um, I want to bring on our last speaker, but definitely not least, um, Aletta Brady. Um, from Our Climate Voices. Aletta Brady, they, them, uses they, them pronouns, is queer, non-binary, bisexual, a bisexual organizer, futurist, writer, and narrative activist living on Dakota land in South Minneapolis. Aletta's work is guided by Audre Lorde's wisdom that without community, there is no liberation. Everything that they do is grounded in the truths that we are more powerful together and that caring for community and caring for self are interwoven essentials to any change-making work. Ain't that the truth, Aletta? Uh, Aletta, let us know what lands are you on? Um, and just tell us more about your work. Hey, yeah, Lael, it's actually so great to finally meet you. We've spoken before. It's nice to see your face. We have. I think I think I was with on your podcast. Yeah, your yeah, podcast. you were with Kia, but I think we had a phone call like a year ago. Um, it's nice to meet you. And thank you guys for having me. Um, thank you for that beautiful introduction. My name is Aletta Brady. My pronouns are they, them. I'm on Dakota land in Minneapolis, Minnesota. 
um, visual description of my screen. Um, I am a white non-binary person with red hair wearing a black turtleneck and gold necklaces with a screen um, behind me with a forest with green trees. Um, so I guess I'm gonna just share my screen with you all. Um, let's see, okay. Are you guys able to see this? Can someone just like come on and let me know? Um, yeah, we can see it, Aletta. Okay, beautiful. Yeah. And, oh no, where is the present button? Right there. Thank you. <laughs> um, all right, is this loading for you guys? It's loading on our end. We have a black screen with the text loading dot, dot, dot. There we go, we're on. Thank you for that visual description. <laughs> <laughs> um, all right, and so Lyle introduced me um, beautifully. I don't have much to add to that. Um, like they said, I'm a bisexual non-binary organizer from South Minneapolis on Dakota land. And um, I am also disabled and dealing with chronic COVID um, right now. And so please be patient with me if I forget some words um, or idioms or misspeak. Um, that's something that has been happening. Um, and I'll dive a bit into the work that I do. So I am the founder and creative director of a storytelling collective that believes in narrative change and narrative activism. And so we really believe in the power of story to both connect people, ground people, and um, compel important action. And so our mission as a collective um, is to humanize the climate crisis through first person storytelling. And we do that through live storytelling, through written storytelling, um, video and audio storytelling. And we really believe that um, like the movement for black lives, the marriage movement, the Me Too movement um, and every other impactful social change movement, there is a deep power in um, collective storytelling and cultivating a culture of empowerment to share our own stories with this crisis in order to bring attention to how serious um, the climate crisis is and the fact that it's happening right now to people that we love in our own communities. Um, and I just wanna shout out my uh, amazing leadership team of six young queer folks, BIPOC and disabled people, just like an all around absolutely inspirational group of folks. Um, that is a pleasure to work with every single day. Um, Okay, so I'm gonna talk a little bit about narrative change and the power of story to compel climate action. So we as an organization, um, and this photograph on the screen is a photograph of me, um, Kate Wiener from Loam and Kylea Frederick from Loam Magazine um, at an event, a storytelling event we hosted in San Francisco in 2019. Um, so we see three key challenges um, to like massive widespread grassroots support for climate action. Um, and the first part of that is that most people in this country don't think that climate change will affect them personally. They think that climate change is an issue that affects other people. And we all know that um, when we understand how something affects, affects us personally, uh, we're much more likely to take action and to show up. Um, second, and this one I think is really growing, um, there's a term called environmental melancholia, which means um, this feeling that we get, it's an anxiety and a fear response that we get when we read about um, the immensity of the climate crisis, right? So when you read articles that are about glaciers melting and sea level rise and sort of doom and gloom, the world is going to end, while there's a lot of importance, obviously, to having that clear and urgent information out there, our, our um, psychological response to that is to shut down, um, our brains shut down. And so that doesn't lead us, that leads us to a state of paralysis rather than a state of action. Um, and the third thing, and I think um, a couple of the other speakers touched on this a little bit, but there is this narrative, this widespread narrative that addressing climate change involves making personal sacrifices or choices that people are not willing or able to make. Um, and I'm going to dive a bit more into this idea. Um, so we talk a lot about how climate change is not a personal failing. And instead, climate change is a systemic issue caused by systemic um, problems. And so um, 
a lot of money and energy and attention has gone into um, making people feel like they're personally, oh no, my computer is about to die. Um, okay. No worries, I'll let it take your time to plug that in. I got it. I just had to flip the switch on the, I had it plugged in. I didn't have the, the outlet switched on. Um, thanks. So where was I? Yes. The fossil fuel industry has invested a lot into making us feel personally guilty um, for our consumer choices, for, you know, um, our personal carbon footprint, for um, being vegan or not being vegan, for recycling or not. And these ideas are one, steeped heavily in racism and classism. Um, because as we all know, um, the people who have the most wealth um, are the ones who contribute the most to climate change. Um, and on top of that, 70% or sorry, 70 companies, what is it? A hundred companies are responsible for 70% of carbon emissions. And so we talk a lot about how this has been a strategic tactic by the oil industry to make us feel shame and guilt and shame others um, rather than rising up in collective um, action and demanding that the folks who are actually culpable for this disaster and actually design the systems that um, proliferate uh, fossil fuels um, be held accountable for this. Um, so this idea of fighting climate change as individuals is something that really benefits industry rather than benefits the collective. Um, and I think that Daisy touched on something here in, in her talk was so beautiful about um, the idea that you were talking about conservation and the idea that in conservation so often people um, talk about they try to extract human beings from the earth and from the land and the relationship that we have with land in place. And so I think that's another thing that um, has really happened is people, um, the importance of place and the importance of cultural ties to place is really discounted. Um, and this is just a really great introductory um, article for anyone who's interested in this idea of fossil fuel industries and neoliberalism um, trying to make us take on this, this crisis in isolation. Um, and I think I'll just add another piece to that. I think this idea um, of climate change as a future issue, I think focusing on things like sea level rise in particular, which is happening gradually, um, has been a really strategic thing for us to think about climate change as something that's happening in the future rather than something that's happening now. Um, and we take, we take our power back um, when we recognize that this is happening now, it's happening to us, it's happening to our communities, to the people that we love um, and on land that we are connected to. Um, and I'm sorry, I'm not able to look at the comments while um, I'm doing this. So. All right, so now we get to narrative change um, work. And so we believe that storytelling, um, first person storytelling and collective storytelling, humanizing the climate crisis combats each of these challenges. Um, the first challenge, thinking that it won't impact us personally, um, it's really important that we understand the myriad of impacts that climate change is happening, that it's having in different places. Um, to people with different positionalities, um, to people with different access to water, to clean air, and the various ways that the climate crisis is manifesting in our lives. And so in sharing our individual stories, but in a collective manner, we're able to see a lot of different ways that this crisis is touching other people's lives, which can also um, create space for us to reflect on how it's touching our own lives and decrease that psychological distance between ourselves and the impacts of climate change. Um, the other thing that story sharing does is that it creates this intimate connection. Um, when we share, we open up in a way that um, allows us to be vulnerable and allows us to connect with people. Um, and likewise, when we listen to someone else, we open up and we really try to connect with them. And while our stories and our experiences may be different, um, we all share a lot of you know common threads that run through story, um, feelings of love for our community, for the places we grew up, 
um, for our loved ones and, you know, maybe fear for the future or hope for the future. Those are things that we can connect to, um, regardless if we've had, you know, a similar, um, or dissimilar experience to what someone is sharing. Um, and then I spoke a bit to this, uh, the third issue of thinking that climate crisis is a, is a personal feeling. Um, but we really focus on the importance of systemic solutions. And I think, um, as Daisy mentioned, the importance of like, there is no one size fit all solution. Um, Place-based solutions are really important and thinking about how to implement um, systemic solutions in place-based ways um, is really important. Um, okay, so talking a little bit about storytelling, um, story sharing, there's a lot of different ways um, to share stories. And um, there's a lot of harmful ways to share stories. And so um, I think that it's really important to think about um, first and foremost, storytelling as a practice that we each take on, um, thinking about our own stories. Um, and I think that this, the first sentence of this quote is really beautiful. Um, Train yourself towards solidarity and not charity. You are no one's savior. You are a mutual partner in the pursuit of freedom. Um, and I think really grounding ourselves in our own narratives, in our own histories, in our own backgrounds, our own families, um, understanding where we come to this movement from, um, the ways in which this crisis touches our own lives, um, helps us show up in solidarity with one another rather than um, seeing ourselves as outside of something. And I think, um, I think this is particularly a really important practice for um, people of privilege, white people, men, straight folks. There is, if you, with levels of privilege, there is an instinct to um, take leadership in spaces to jump in and to act as a, as a voice of authority. And I think that the practice of grounding ourselves, I think that that sometimes comes from a, a frantic need um, to justify something. And I think that the practice of like grounding ourselves in, okay, what does it mean to me, Aletta Brady, to have experienced um, ostracization, lost almost all my family when I came out and like understanding what it is to lose a safety net. That's something I can bring to this movement, what it feels like when everything sort of like falls out under you. And what does it mean to have community that is based in mutuality and resiliency? Um, and also understanding that as someone who um, had the privilege of my parents standing by me, I didn't have to experience houselessness. And I was able to, in some ways that enabled me to have this, be in this situation now where I can, I can speak and I can have access. Right. So what, how do we, how do we understand, um, and connect with the various, um, the various ways that this crisis is touching our lives and our communities? Um, I think that helps us move from a more grounded place and from a place of solidarity. And, um, I think that the beauty of storytelling is it really gives other people permission to open up as well um, and share what they want to share and like learn and uh, move in that way. So we practice as an organization um, what we call ethical storytelling, which is really the practice of honoring ourselves and others when we're sharing narratives and um, recognizing that storytelling can is often is way too often extractive. Um, and instead we really want to ground our belief in narrative, narrative change as something that is, we each decide what we want to share narratively and we um, make space with one another to listen and, and hold space for that. So I'm looking at the time. Um, I guess I will just go through this quickly, but we, um, talk a lot about organizationally for organizations that are engaging in sort of narrative change work and engaging in storytelling, um, the importance of above all else, honoring the storytelling sovereignty of every single individual, right? Like we each own our own, my story is mine to share, um, if and how I want to, um, as is yours. And so when we are, when someone is trusting us to potentially, um, share out something that is theirs, um, we have to be really okay 
with being able to release our power and like not have someone else's story shared in a way we want it to be shared, which um, have it shared in the way they want it to be shared. And also, also be okay with um, someone not wanting to share their story. Right. And I think that um, we don't often enough hold space for people to change their minds, um, to come into something and say, I'm really excited about this. I really want to share. And then for the moment to come for them to share and they no longer feel like sharing. Maybe it's become the feeling has changed. It's become too vulnerable. We've had storytellers have family members who don't want them to share their story, who have decided it was too personal, who have um, just generally decided their feelings change. Um, and those are stories that we don't share. And so um, just always grounding ourselves in the, um, the sovereignty of our own selves and our own narratives. Um, Okay, so these are some examples. This is an example I just shared um, of ways that we can connect with the climate crisis in story story sharing. Um, this was, Mumbatu is um, an amazing human being um, who was a part of our first um, Queer Liberation and Climate Justice podcast episode. Um, talking about the ways in which queer and trans folks are particularly impacted by climate crisis. But not just that, also thinking about the deep wisdom that queer and trans communities have um, around building resilient um, and caring and compassionate systems of response in the face of crisis. Um, this was a conversation that we had about disability justice and climate change. And again, thinking about both the ways in which um, disabled folks are disproportionately impacted by climate crises, um, but also the importance of disabled leadership as a community that is um, continually paving the way, um, showing us how to um, work in ways that are interconnected and interwoven and not sort of like getting outside of this individualistic framework of like, I have to do everything for myself. Um, Jason Charger is absolutely amazing. If you don't know them, you should check them out. They're an amazing organizer um, and are actually, I believe were, they locked themselves down at the Keystone XL pipeline in October. We were there, um, we're filming a video piece on them and they um, are just a really um, amazing young person who is unafraid to speak truth to power and talk a lot about, um, as Daisy spoke to, the importance of indigenous sovereignty, the importance of land back, the importance of um, indigenous leadership in this space. Um, ooh. Alrighty, so to chat a bit about the importance of climate visioning. So one of the things that we think about is it's so important to cultivate hope in this space. And um, also remembering, I think it's really easy to come in and think that um, we need to add something new. And I think often the answer is to actually just listen and learn. And um, like I've mentioned a little bit, there are a lot of people, um, thinkings of Afrofuturism, queer liberation, indigenous sovereignty, disability justice activists, people who have been visioning and thinking about what um, a collective and free and liberated and supportive and resilient future looks like for a long time. Um, and so I think that in some ways, um, turning towards the leadership of those who have already been embodying these practices of what a climate just future could look like is the best thing that we can do. So I think it's really important to practice what the world is that we want to see um, as a practice of hope in this space that can be so um, desolate sometimes, thinking about what do we envision when we think about um, the most beautiful and liberated world that we're striving towards? What does that actually look like? What is envisioning what what that feels like, what that smells like, what that tastes like? What, what does it look like walking around? Um, 
And also thinking about what climate narratives have you heard that have moved you? Um, how have they changed your mind? And I think, you know, just to leave you guys with this, we have, we host storytelling workshops for folks to get in touch with their own climate stories. Um, and the most common thing that folks come to the space with is I don't have a climate story. I'm not as impacted as someone else. I don't have anything to say. And while I think it's really important to be mindful of, um, you know, like taking up space in, in movements, on panels, um, at speaker events, that is important, thinking about our positionality. Um, that doesn't mean that we can't understand, that we don't need to understand for ourselves the ways in which this, this crisis is personal to us. And I think that that is, has been a weapon of the fossil fuel industry to make us feel like so many of us feel like this isn't, I don't have enough to say to engage. And if you think about like, for example, the Me Too movement, um, anyone who feels like they have a stake in that um, would feel like they have something to say. And it wouldn't be a conversation about Mm, my situation wasn't as bad as my friend's situation. So like, I'm not going to say anything at all. Right. And my deep hope is that we can continue to connect, start connecting with the climate crisis in this way, where we're really grounded in this is personal for me. This is personal for you. And if you've never thought about it, I'm going to sit with you and talk, talk about it, talk about how is the weather changing around you? Are you still able to run in the summer or is it too hot? Are your kids able to swim in the lake or is there's too much algae? Um, is your neighborhood too polluted? Um, did you see the smoke from the wildfire? Because all of those things are impacts, right? Um, and understanding that and understanding the grief that comes with that, the anxiety that comes with that helps us one heal, hold space for each other. Um, and also understand that this is a personal crisis to all of us and show up from a place of solidarity. Um, so yeah, I believe that is most of what I have to say. Um, here are our socials, feel free to reach out, connect. We love connecting with people. For me, connection is all that there is. Um, and this beautiful art piece I wanna shout out um, Chelsea, who runs our amazing art residency for teens, um, and Carmen, who is a brilliant artist and, and came up with this piece um, called Climate Grief, which is just, I think, really moving and like, in some ways, sad, but also joyful. And I think remembering that in our grieving, something beautiful can emerge um, is important. So thank you to Carmen and Chelsea for that. And I will stop now and I am looking forward to um, any questions you guys have. Thank you so much, Aletta. Can y'all hear me? Can you hear me, Aletta? Yeah, okay. Thank you. That was amazing. Um, as a filmmaker, as an artist, as a cultural worker, it's just seeing the breakdown and how much intentionality and there is in this work just really sparks me. Let's tell more stories. Let's tell the story of Daisy and let's tell the story of Lauren. Let's tell the story of all the folks that they're connected with. This is, this is just really inspiring to my heart. We want to move on to the Q&A portion of our time together. Let's bring on Daisy and Lauren. Uh, thanks for coming back, y'all. Can y'all give us like a mic check? Like, I'm here. Hey, hey. I'm here. <laughs> yeah. Yes. All right, y'all. So I think we're encouraging the attendees to ask any questions. As a reminder, Daisy is doing a lot of Indigenous sovereignty, Indigenous rights, Indigenous at support and specifically shifting the wealth and power over to as many indigenous folks as possible, which can't do anything in this world, unfortunately, without money. And it's just so necessary to realize that that, as Lauren has pointed out, that has been built on the backs of so many of our people. So why not shift it as fast as possible? Um, and thank you so much, Aleta, for spelling out, how do we tell these stories? How do we tell the stories of us? And it's best specifically weaving in the mental health component. We're definitely all impacted by the colonial implications of living in this world. 
I think we got our first question from Sonia Irfan. Apologies if I have said that um, wrong. Uh, so I think this is a question for all three folks. Um, in your activism, how do you all balance between developing hope for a just future, but also raising the alarm that the future looks dystopic if nothing is done for now? Maybe we can, if any of our speakers feel excited to jump in first. Daisy, I see you unmuted yourself. I was going to call on Lauren because I think <laughs> she always gets the engines turning for us and brings that passion. So I'm going to call out Lauren to go first, if you don't mind. That call in. Cool. Um, thank you, Daisy. <laughs> um, I was really looking forward to all to your to the both of your responses to this, but I'll I'll give what my gut was telling me in the beginning was that um, I don't tend to follow the narratives around raising an alarm. I find that it is destructive and this climate urgency is used to put hope and partnership in the very entities that are driving the injustice. I hear this you know, urgency really feeding into white supremacy in a lot of it. Um, so I tend to not go there. Um, you know, I, you know, the Rowan White um, in one of our, our broadcasts, an indigenous sea keeper said that white people have an easier time imagining the end of the world than the end of capitalism. If there's urgency that I celebrate, it's the urgency to dismantle this damn system. Um, so that's just me, but I'd love to hear what everybody else thinks. Or I can go in. So the question again, in your activism, how do you all balance between developing hope for a just future, but also raising the alarm? Um, yeah, so I think for me, I think a lot of it, because I feel so privileged to have grown, been grown and raised in my culture, I'm, I have a lot of understanding of what the past was. And, and that really drives my hopes for the future of, of returning to those traditional ways of life. And, and my family is practicing that, right? We're, we grow our foods. My sister, you know, leads an immersion language program on our reservation. She's creating new speakers in our communities. And so it, to me, it's finding ways now and presently, one, to be realistic to the conditions that we're in and find ways right now to, to, live and operate in two worlds, both in navigating these challenges, navigating these systems, and creating small wins that, that work towards building a bigger and brighter future for all of us. And so, like, like I was mentioning, like, as an Indigenous person, like, I live in two worlds. I live in my culture. I live in my language. I live in the realities of what it means to be an Indigenous person, the good and the bad, and living in a modern world and all of these challenges. And I'm, I'm, I'm not, you know, and I know that it's never going to hundred percent go back to the way things were, but it's finding ways to integrate those ways of life um, to support the collective. Um, so that, that's, I guess, how I look at it. I'd love to hear what Aletta has to say. Yeah. Thank you both. Um, I think it's a really good question. I think that, um, I would like to see us getting more comfortable holding space for multiple truths because um, this crisis does feel urgent. And I also understand um, that a lot of that urgency is based in capitalism and white supremacy. Um, and at the same time, people, you know, we are barreling towards something that has a time, a time limit on it. And so I think, I think, if possible, we can hold both of those things. Um, I personally don't, I have personally leaned into the importance, especially um, leaning into being a disabled leader and the importance of, um, we can't do things if we're exhausted and urgency leads to burnout, it leads to exhaustion, right? And so something can be urgent and we don't need to act urgently. We can act from a place that's grounded and um, rested and also, I think another thing that comes, so, so I believe that um, 
like hope and connection actually creates more long-term change. And I think something that also helps um, with that feeling that can emerge is recognizing that none of us can solve this crisis on our own, nor should we try um, because that would be like dictatorship and that would be harmful in a million ways, right? So like, I'm only one person, I'm burnt out and overwhelmed. I need to rest. Lyell is, is out there, you know, they're right. <laughs> Um, yeah that's what I will say uh thanks for that definitely hearing a pattern of let's hold complexity more you can dream and build and also ignore and also bring in the intersectional and I love that I think there's no one way to cope with this and to move forward so I hope that was a a good answer Sonia let us know what you think on the chat box uh if you have any follow-up we have a question from Samuel. I would love to know your thoughts on how to use non-traditional forms of storytelling to elevate, redshift the climate narrative, for instance, sci-fi, horror, or virtual reality. And how can these formats also be used to heal the divides within the environmental movement too? As additional context, I love everything you mentioned about individual versus collective action. And that's also a big theme in the climate space as a whole too. What do y'all think? Could someone let me know what redshift means? Let's see what happens in the chat box. What is redshift? What is what? Samuel Rubin, uh, we're asking what is redshift? So you put in here, elevate or redshift? Maybe it's, it's a typo, maybe just shift, elevate or shift. Did you mean regarding reshift? Maybe while they answer that, let's, um, throw that in and maybe just focus on the word elevate since it was elevate or redshift. So storytelling to elevate climate narratives. Mm -hmm. um, I can go first. So I think, you know, just my first reaction to like non-traditional forms of storytelling to me kind of comes from a, a little bit of a place of privilege, right? Because I think there are because we're already putting in a box of like, this is how storytelling is today. And this is what's respected. And this is what it's valued. And, and the truth is that when we, I guess we would define non-traditional forms of storytelling, these are things that Indigenous peoples have, have used or applied to articulate our narratives and our stories and our, our, our songs and our prayers since millennia, but now is viewed as non-traditional, but yet our kind of the foundation, I, I would say, of storytelling. Um, but I guess as we're thinking about in this modern world, you know, at Cultural Survival, um, we, uh, one of our programs is our community media program. And what we do through that is we work to collaborate and uplift, empower and resource Indigenous communities um, to, in their kind of self-determined approach to, um, uh, to expressing themselves. And that is often through community radio stations. And so we know in the United States that tool is less used or less active. And, and we know that because the access technology and resources is very different in the United States compared to other parts of the world, especially in the global South. Um, but that's a really powerful tool that indigenous peoples use to both communicate, um, for storytelling, to organize, all of these different things. And so I think if we're thinking about storytelling, we also have to recognize that not everyone has the same access to resources, to tools, um, or even their rights to express themselves are honored and respected. It's, it's really a spectrum. So that's kind of my, my reaction. And then I, the second part of that question is around healing. And one thing that I notice a lot in just all of these movements is the siloed effect and segregation of these movements. And, and what's missing a lot from these movements is this component of healing and that we need to, to support healing across communities, across identities, across cultures. And I think storytelling in whatever form it is used um, can be one way to support healing and bridge communities. Amazing answer, Daisy. And for bringing us back to like, actually, this is traditional. I like that. Any other thoughts, Lauren or Letta? 
That was amazing. Thank you. I appreciated all of that. I'm just trying to pull up this ethical storytelling because I was blown away, Aletta, at what you were doing. I mean, it's just amazing. I have to, to think about that and marinate on that. Thank you so much for sharing. Um, cultural survival, Daisy, the work you guys do with storytelling is, you know, I'm just here to learn. So it's nothing to add there. Thanks, y'all. Well, there's plenty of uh, smaller things to reflect on. We have a question here, or a comment from Marie, which maybe it's worth that we put it all on y'all's plate, see if it sparks a conversation. We'd love to hear some hot tips to put pressure on the corporations who are causing the most harm to our world and BIPOC communities. How do we do this work, essentially, when it's the corporations that are doing so much damage? This is like the million dollar question, I think. These big beasts that we are coming across. So some hot tips, how do we do this? How do we put pressure on them? I'll, I'll jump in and I don't have the solution to this. I'll just say that first off, if I did, we wouldn't, none of us have the solution to this, but I think I'll just add quickly. Um, I think that it's really about collective action. I really believe in collective action. And I think that that starts at the local level. Um, there's a lot of ways that we can impact corporations that are local in our cities and the places that we live in. Um, I also believe in disruptive action in direct action. I think that disrupting um, business as usual, making it challenging for people. Like last weekend, I was in a car caravan protest along the line three route, right? And we just slowed down to the minimum speed limit and just drove at that speed limit. That's not going to change it overnight, but causing disruption leads to attention, leads to people thinking and talking about it. And I think that the more we can I think there's ego that goes into national organizing that I think is sometimes harmful um, because oftentimes it's it's about attention to be completely honest. And I think that really grounding ourselves where we are, you can really impact your city council members. You can really impact like your local government. Um, so, so that's what I would say. I think that like really concentrated strategic collective campaigns to disrupt um, fossil fuel industry and corporations that are investing in the fossil fuel industry um is the way to go but yeah. i just just to add to that um yeah i think at the individual level it's really changing our behavior and and what companies that we're buying from and doing the homework um of who is in their supply chains how are those supply chains impacting bipoc communities impacting indigenous communities impacting local communities we really have to do the the homework and and sometimes that information is not available, but it doesn't mean that we don't have a moral responsibility to figuring out what that information is. And there's a lot of great organizations, um, you know, like a growing culture and so many others who are uplifting those truths. So identifying the, those organizations that have access to that information and doing the work. I agree with the collective approach and, and collaborating with other, whether it's individuals or organizations or whatever, um, in whatever kind of institution to really create these, these platforms and, and these campaigns. I think what's really important if people or institutions are in a place of privilege or power or have resources to uplift and center and fund BIPOC leadership and BIPOC institutions, they can lead those discussions and and it's when you're working in collaboration with them it's being a good follower it's being a good listener and putting your money where your mouth is and creating this shared vision and rec and and being ready like aletta was sharing to to back up and to make space we have we have to do that and 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 so as an individual or an institution if you have direct access to those corporations or or know someone who has access to be ready to make those introductions and be ready to support those individuals going into those conversations you know it's putting your money where your mouth is um, creating shared visions and platforms alongside BIPOC communities and being ready to step back um, and allowing those folks to reclaim their narrative and assert their rights and assert um, their priorities in those spaces 
I love, I love that. Let's put pressure from the outside. Let's put pressure from the inside and let's shed light on the proper stories and experiences that need to get um, seen. I got our last question here as we're running out of time. So just if y'all could be brief to let our attendees and honor their time. Last question is what does supporting the land back movement look like for someone not indigenous and likewise for global and local farmer led movements? Lauren, you go first. <laughs> you always put me on the spot. Um, yeah. I, um, I think that it looks, I mean, Lila Watson's quote, right? Which if you came here to help, we don't want your help, but if you came here because our liberation is bound, Aleta, thank you for sharing that. I mean, that's it. Like, we have to recognize just what Daisy said. We all benefit from land back, right? Um, I think there was another thing in your presentation, Aleta, which was, um, you know, pay your privilege and then pay more, right? Like, people that are trying to understand the concept of, of sovereignty that come from a place of privilege, of never being forced off the land, never um being kidnapped never never being forced to exist in a system that designs to oppress them it's a really hard thing for them to understand because the first step is to recognize your privilege is to see how everything that you have ever benefited from every, every everything is because of the exploitation of others and that's when you know like your food becomes bitter and your possessions become painful memories and your privilege becomes guilt but then take that and fight use it as a strength and an opportunity and fight and fight and fight and ask those questions, name and shame the ones that aren't. Look at the nonprofits out there that are bourgeois and elitist led that aren't doing the real work, that are just sitting there to support the greenwashing of others and ask those questions, go deep and fight. Like that's what it takes. It's, it's about not knowing what the answer looks like but being committed to the process. And that's yeah. all I can say. Yeah, I want to share a really, really dope example um, from the Bay Area called the Segorite Land Trust. Um, they have what is called the Shaumi tax, um, which is essentially this voluntary tax um, system where it encourages those who live in their territory in the Lonely Lands to make um, one time or monthly contributions, financial contributions in-kind contributions, actual donations of land, right? Um, as an example of what both indigenous peoples are leading and creating the movement and the institutions to receive that and how they're galvanizing the larger community and those guests who are living on their land um, to support land back efforts. So that's one example. But even if those institutions don't exist, right, as an indigenous land trust, you can still find ways to donate resources. And when I say resources, it's not always financial resources to indigenous communities, right? That's donating your time. It's volunteering at an event. It's donating a microwave to a community center. It's, you know, donating all of these different material and, and, and non-material items and service to support indigenous peoples. Right, because when you're investing and um, in indigenous communities at any level, whether it has a direct connection to land, it still goes to supporting their livelihoods and, and, and their futures and their values, which it upholds the collective. Um, so I would say those are some examples, but I think some additional examples is, um, you know, if you don't have the resources to donate, um, it's really uplifting BIPOC and indigenous narratives on your social media. It's having conversations um, with your families at dinner. It's having, or Zoom, right? I know a lot of us aren't being able to see our families, but hosting Zoom sessions on the things that you're learning from BIPOC leaders. Um, all of this no, might not right now, tomorrow, have a direct impact on land back. But if you're investing and in BIPOC leadership, you're decolonizing yourself, your families, um, and unlearning all of these things 
that contributes to the movement. And you will then be in a better position to maybe someday make those direct financial resources. Or again, you're, you're supporting the, what's just as valuable is shifting consciousness because shifting consciousness, consciousness shifts behaviors and shifts how people allocate their money and make decisions about our land. That's it. Thank you. That's, that's just it. Let me just drop the mic and you can use your privilege or education, pick how you can help. Thank you, Daisy. Thank you, Lauren. Thank you, Aletta, for your time and to be respectful of the participants here. Thanks for staying three minutes over. I'm actually going to use Aletta's quote to kind of wrap us up. So to kind of wrap up this whole conversation of everything from indigenous rights, indigenous story to indigenous storytelling and storytelling and narrative amplification and supporting the food web and the food uh, supply recognition and decolonizing. Let's start with the piece around solidarity, which is very true to us in this moment in which we are facing a lot of hatred and violence from white supremacy as a collective of BIPOC and as a collective of people fighting for a better world. So if you have come here to help me, you are wasting your time. But if you have come because your liberation is bound up with mine, then let us work together. Lila Watson, thank you so much, Aletta, for leaving us with that. And I'll pass it over to Devin. Y'all have a wonderful night. Thank you so much, Leo. Thank you to the organizers. You guys have done so much to make this happen. There's a lot of people that we can't see here. And I just really want to appreciate you all and the interpreters. Thank you. Um, can everyone in, uh, hear and see me okay? I just wanted to hop in and do a quick closing to wrap up today's session. Yes, yeah. we can hear you. Okay, great. Uh, my name is Devin and my pronouns are she, her. I'm calling in today from Tongva land in Los Angeles, California. I'm a Caucasian female with blonde hair and I'm wearing a gray sweater. Um, I have a couple of... Um, Canvas is behind me, one which has fallen off the wall. Uh, we just wanted to thank you guys all so much for joining us tonight. It was such a pleasure to have such an engaging conversation um, surrounding the importance of shifting the climate narrative. Uh, we did record this conversation, which will be available in the next few weeks and we'll be sharing in an effort to help continue what we feel is such an important dialogue. Um, we just wanted to thank all of our speakers our moderator, our interpreters and our technical team for making this session possible and accessible. We're so grateful to continuously learn from all of you and continue to uplift the work you are doing for our planet and for your communities. Uh, we also recognize that it's been a hard and tough week for so many people. So we appreciate you making the time to be with us here today. And we ask folks to rest and nourish themselves as much as possible. Um, and to learn more about the Kenny Harris campaign, you can visit cyhu.org. We will drop the link in the chat. And we'd also love following this session, um, especially if you have any feedback regarding accessibility, we'd love to improve for our next and last session. Lastly, we invite you to join tomorrow's Friday of Action, which is focused on reclaiming climate narratives. Every Friday, we share different narratives, uh, different measures, excuse me, that you can take to learn more about various climate movements and how you may be able to elevate the work of those pushing for collective action and systemic change. So keep an eye out for that tomorrow on our socials at CYHU Movement and have a great rest of your evening and please take care.